at the end of the day, what matters most? And, you know, it's something that I think about a lot. And I think what matters most is, are we connected? Mm. People that really, truly care about us unconditionally. Do we know where we came from? Do we know where we belong? Do we know that we're valued? Do we have the relational health and well-being that can allow for all the other aspects of our life to be successful? And I get, um, I get concerned that there are too many kids that have gone through the foster care experience that don't know where they belong. They don't necessarily know where they came from. They don't feel as connected as, as they need to be. School is in. But are you really ready to learn? Open your eyes to a new day in education with The Awakening Educator, a program specifically designed to explore a new mindful way of educating our youth. Learn about social-emotional learning, new modalities of teaching, and the most relevant topics in education with your hosts, Susan Andrian and Megan Sweet. Susan and Megan will take you inside the issues by looking at them from different points of view, from policies and research to teaching models that are actually used in schools. There's never a dull moment in this classroom. You can catch The Awakening Educator every other Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker, Facebook Live, WDJY 99.1 FM, WTTA 101.2, Talk 10 FM, and many other platforms. You can also watch it on our app anytime from anywhere in the world at uimediaapp.com. Have any questions you'd like to ask? Maybe you have knowledge you'd like to share. Call 678-495-4345 and share your thoughts live on air. Grab a pen and paper and get ready to open your textbooks and minds to a new way of learning on The Awakening Educator. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Awakening Educator. I'm Susan Andrian. I'm Megan Sweet. And I'm so excited to introduce our guest today, Matt Anderson, who is with the Institute for Family and the Children's Home and. Uh, he's also the host of Seen Out Loud, a podcast for uh, highlights families in the foster care system. Um, I'm going to let Matt introduce himself before I fumble it anymore. So, Matt, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We're so excited about this super important conversation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation and, you know, uh, allowing me to have the conversation with you and your audience. And yeah, so I, I live in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I've been here for about 10 years, and I I work for Children's Home Society of North Carolina, where about uh, two years ago, we launched the Institute for Family as a new part of how we achieve our mission. Our mission is all about family. Um, At the end of the day, that's really what it is. And the Institute for Family is a way for us to achieve our mission about keeping families together. In other words, how do we invest in families and communities so that we keep kids out of the foster care system in the first place. And, um, you know, I've uh, been working in the child welfare field for, I guess, 15 years now and uh, started in graduate school um, at the University of Montana doing my MSW there. And that's that was my introduction to child welfare and have had, uh, a, a, I don't know if a long career, but most of my career has really been focused on improving or reforming the foster care system specifically preventing kids from aging out of foster care. And I've done a lot of work there. And, and really, honestly, the last two or three years have had a real shift in what, what the job really is and what my purpose is. And it's not about preventing kids from aging out of foster care. It's really about preventing foster care in the first place, which means mm. really making sure families have what they need to thrive. So that's kind of what, what we're up to now. So it's, it's, I, I think, and I've listened to your podcast several times, and really this idea of reimagining mm-hmm. how we're showing up to support families and to support children in a way that more um, radically meets the needs of the whole family, because we know kids are better off when they're with their families. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're, you know, we obviously come from the lens of thinking about education and education um in a very holistic way, you know, I'm, I've started Hope Reimagined, which is really in line with your mission of reimagining what are we, what are we doing, uh, mm-hmm. both in education, what are we doing in our healing communities to try and make sure that we are um, 
healing the whole community, not trying to react and respond in ways that we all know have caused more harm. I'm curious about this, how your job has really changed, how you've been rethinking what what foster care can uh, or should look like or not exist at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's, it's a really, really important question facing not just our child welfare field, but it should be, it should be facing our, our criminal justice field, our education system. You know, there's so many different systems that serve kids and families in different ways. And we should all be wrestling with the question of um, how do we make sure families have what they need to stay together, to thrive, for kids to meet milestones, to do well in education, school, you know, what have you. I think it's a it's a it's a it's a question for us as a country to really grapple with, and it's not a question of of just the child welfare system grappling with that question of how do we keep families together. Um, but I, I guess for me, um, you know, I've spent so many years in the child welfare field and working with kids and families in child welfare, whether it's birth families, adoptive foster families, kids that have been reunified or aged out or adopted. And at the end of the day, what matters most? And, you know, it's something that I think about a lot. And I think what matters most is, are we connected? Mm. People that really, truly care about us unconditionally. Do we know where we came from? Do we know where we belong? Do we know that we're valued? Do we have the relational health and well-being that can allow for all the other aspects of our life to be successful? And I get, um, I get concerned that there are too many kids that have gone through the foster care experience that don't know where they belong. They don't necessarily know where they came from. They don't feel as connected as, as they need to be. And I think it's that sort of fundamental human need that we all have that is driving me around. How do we make sure that we don't have to have these disruptions and interruptions and separations in the first place? I don't know if I answered your question, Susan. Yeah, it, well, I think it, it, there were definitely parts of it that that we we have a lot to talk about. There's a lot of rich kind of context that you were bringing in. Yeah. Megan, I know I was cutting you off. I'm sorry. You're okay. All good. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk with you today for a couple of reasons. One is that I think uh, many of us that work in education aren't always really aware of what the life and the experience of a child that's in foster care is. Um, and what their lived experience might be and how that whole side works. Part of that's because we're not supposed to know, right? Like we, we, we know that they're in foster care and that's because we have to report on that. I mean, that's truly where it gets down to is like we report on that in California anyway. Mm -hmm, sure. And we need to provide specialized programming for kids in foster care, but because of um, the very necessary um, requirement for confidentiality for kids and what their experience is, um, often as educators, we don't really know what their lived experience is or how they got there, um, whether or not it's good or bad. I mean, I have some experience in the foster with um, students that were in the foster care system, but mostly, I actually, my mind goes to like movie versions of what <laughs> being in foster care is, because it is somewhat of a mystery, I think, to many educators. So what would you want educators to know about kids that are in foster care? Um, as they're starting to work with kids that maybe they find out are, have been, are, are in a foster home or in the system in some way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think there are a few things. Um, one, I would want educators to know that in your class, in your school, there are kids who are in foster care. Mm -hmm. I, I think to your point of it's, it's, you know, there are confidentiality and privacy reasons that are important that that's not always really known. You know, do you have kids in your school that are in foster care? In all likelihood, the answer is yes. And so I think you need to, to know that. And um, then I think simply, honestly, if, if a kid is in foster care, they're just a kid like any other kid. Hmm. Now, that might, that might mean that there are different needs that they have, right? But I think that what I've, what I've heard from so many young people that experience foster care that in different parts of their lives you know, to be in foster care is is being marginalized, being stigmatized, being left out, being the the only one, you know, those sorts of things that are not normalized, just childhood experiences. 
you know, it's really, really important that kids going through the foster care system have normal childhood experiences to, to, to as much as possible. Um, so I think those two things are really important to me. And I think then, you know, if you know that they're in your school and you know that they know, you know that they're just like any other kid, um, then how can you start to get to know what that experience really is like? So are there ways in which you can, for me, this is where I go. How do you, how do you listen to the stories of young people in foster care? How do you learn from those experiences? And then how do you use that as kind of your guide and teacher of what, what should, what should you do to be most supportive and helpful if there are kids in foster care in your school? So, you know, kids that have experienced it are the teachers um, in many cases. And then I think maybe the last thing that, that immediately came to mind because the, the example is so great and it's school-based is um, Dr. Bruce Perry and his new book, um, What Happened to You. I think all educators should, should read that book and for all kinds of reasons. It's, I think it's a must read, but there's a story in there that, that is a, a kid in foster care and is, I think, math teacher. And if the math teacher had a what happened to you framework of it's not what's wrong with this kid, why is this kid a bad kid? It's what do I need to understand about this kid's story, background, experience that might be driving some of what's happening? And if I understand that, then how would I act differently to make sure this, this kid is actually getting what, what he needs? And it's a really powerful story that he tells in the book. So I would... Well, yeah. well, our audience and Megan will know uh, whenever we bring Dr. Perry into the conversation. You, you have Someone geeks out. <laughs> yeah, well, somebody geeks out. I don't know who. Um, but and we interviewed Dr. Perry before uh, last, a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic, actually before his, and before what happened to you came out. Um, and it, it, it's definitely how I think of how we need to organize both our environments, like how are we creating environments that are therapeutic and healing regardless of what kids' experiences are. And I'm really uh, grateful that you pointed out they're kids, right? And so what we need to do is show up and provide them rich relational uh, environments that are mapped to their developmental needs that help them learn to grow and thrive in every area of their life. And, and if we, you know, education, I think we, we focus on the cognitive. We're always trying to get to the prefrontal cortex and the executive functioning. Uh, and many schools really miss, like, actually, we got to go through the bottom part of the brain and we got to get to that part of the thinking. So to learn math, you also have to have a good relationship with that kid and they have to feel regulated in their body and they have to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of connection and a sense of safety. Um, and, and so for some kids, that's more challenging, right? We know their catalog of experiences of a kid who's in foster care, uh, whatever happened to lead to that experience, or just even being in foster care alone, it, that loss of primary parent um, or caregiver is going to cause some sensitivity to that some relational sensitivity that we need to learn how to show up in a way that helps them. Um, so that was my... really basic stuff. Yeah. too. Like that, what's so interesting about that story is that, you know, what they came to realize is the teacher was wearing the same deodorant of this young man's father. Mm -hmm. And so obviously this, this kid had a very complicated, complex relationship with his father um, that when he would smell that deodorant, that would, that would trigger him. And now he's having a trauma response that is not recognized as a trauma response. It's recognized as an ADHD response or a, this is just a bad kid response or, you know, but it's not. It's, it's something very specific that if we had that what happened to you frame and we were relational and asking the right questions, you know, the teacher might might do something different. Um, yeah, the showing up with curiosity that right. allowed them to figure out this connection between the old spice and, oh, maybe we're not supposed to say the name of the deodorant, but um, <laughs> hey, it was in the book. It's in the book, right? Yes. Yeah. So how would you, um, with families too, there's often these times that families have, still have uh, educational rights, but don't have don't have access to their kids. And I'm curious about how that might show up in some of the ways that you're, you're supporting families and that this is a way to still stay connected 
uh, through those educational rights, but also it provides a lot of complexity. Yeah. So are, are you asking like, how does, if a, if a child is in foster care, how does their birth family parents stay involved in their education? Well, I, I, yes. And I think that there are, at least in the state of California, and I, I imagine this might look differently, but sometimes we'll have kids that are in foster care uh, who have a foster parent and a social worker and then their biological family. Um, and the, the parents, the biological parents still hold the educational rights. So things like um, uh, kids who need an individual education plan or special education evaluation, where you need the consent of the parent who still holds educational rights, but for various reasons, they're in a lot of distress and so it can create these complexities. And I'm wondering if that's something that you work yeah. with. Much. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And so maybe the place to start with that is just, you know, keeping in mind, you know, if you're not that familiar with the child welfare system and how things really work, you know, a child comes into foster care for some combination of abuse and neglect. Um, we tend to think that foster care is about physical or sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And it's a parent or caregiver doing physical harm to a child. In most cases, that's not what's happening. It's, it's neglect in some form or fashion. Um, and so I think it's just important to, to know that, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, it just is a different frame of who these parents are, right? It may be, you know, poverty issues that are really driving the neglect. That's a mm -hmm. big conversation happening in child welfare right now is poverty neglect in the eyes of child welfare. Um, and so I think we, we keep that in mind and then know that, you know, the goal initially is, is almost always reunification. Mm -hmm. The goal is to get that child back home to their parents. So what do we need to do to make that happen, to make that successful, to give that parent a chance to reunify? There are a lot of different things that we can do. One of, I think, the most important things that we can do is give that parent agency, control, responsibility, involvement, recognizing the, the power that they have to be a positive force in their child's life. In other words, not reinforcing the shame and guilt that they already have around their child being mm -hmm. in foster care and whatever those circumstances were. Let's counteract the shame and guilt that they have by giving them agency and power and opportunity to be involved. And so where can you do that? There's all kinds, like, a common thing that we see a lot is just decisions about hair care and hygiene and these sorts of things. So mm -hmm. parents need to be um, signing off on the hairstyle that a foster parent might want to have that child have. Or in school, that's another great example. It's, if it's an IEP or whatever the case may be, how do we keep that parent actively involved and engaged? You know, if there's a, a meeting that's happening at the school, can the parent be invited to that meeting? You know, I think we can find, you know, or is there a real strength that that parent has, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in the, 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 the education of, that, of their child? Is there something that they can do during visits? You know, so mandatory visits are part of the child welfare system. That parent's going to be meeting with that child um, as they work towards reunification. So is there homework assignments they could do together, you know, that, that would really speak to, to that parent's strength? So I think just getting creative and thinking about, okay, if the goal here is to get this child back home, and part of that means counteracting the shame and guilt that that parent already has, then how can a teacher do that? How can a principal do that? Yeah, you said a couple of really powerful things, Matt, that I just want to underscore before we, we take our, our first break. Um, the first one is this idea of curiosity and um, not making assumptions about what we think is true about kids and um and what might be driving their behavior which i think is is good information and in an important way of looking at any child's behavior because almost always it's not what you think it is and i actually did this the other day i'm being a principal right now at a high school i did it myself i a kid was texting it's against the rules to text um and so i was like all right well give me your phone that's what's up and i'll you know you can get it back tomorrow your mom can come and get it because i had talked with him about it yeah. And he refused and he he got more increasingly more upset. Um, and uh, luckily, somebody who knew the kid came in and like talked to him and calmed him down. He didn't know me either. So that didn't help. Right. I was suddenly this authority figure that was taking his phone away. Yeah. 
But what was ended up being behind his anxiety wasn't actually um, the loss of his phone uh, mm -hmm. per se. It was because his mom's a single mom and she works. And there would be no way for her to pick her child up after school or get the phone. In fact, he relies on the phone for transportation home. He uses, you know, an Uber or something like that. Not my favorite for kids to do, but so it goes. But so like that was like, so he felt like this instant like anxiety and protection for his mom that I was missing completely in my battle with him about a telephone. Um, and if I had just asked some more questions or in my own space, like when he started to amp up, if I had slowed down, but I was then I was like, I was meeting him. I was like, oh, you're going to say no to me. Yeah. Game, Like, let's go yeah. for more instead right. of like slowing down and getting curious. So it happens quickly. Um, it can happen well intended, but like, you know, instantly. Yeah. And as soon as I heard what the story was, I just fell in love with the kid. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm a single mom, too. I totally get what you're doing and you're protecting your mom. And, you know, like so suddenly it just became a very different situation. Um, and if we don't approach things with curiosity, then we miss that. And then we get into these battles and that teacher. I, don't, I didn't read the story, but I imagine the teacher with the old spice. Like that's a place where you can start to battle with a kid constantly. Right. Because that feels personal. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels like this kid's showing up just trying to mess me up. So I think the idea of being curious and really trying to understand that for the most part, no human um, wants to, you know, go sideways at anyone. And certainly kids right. don't. Um, but we don't always have the words to explain what's going on or it's happening too quickly. Right. Um, the other thing that you shared that I really appreciated was um, this idea of finding ways to integrate the birth parents in a foster care experience. I know that's a lot more of what you do. I'd love to talk about that when we come back from break, because I hadn't thought about that either, actually, um, of ways to include the birth parents. I always just never know how to handle that. So I think even giving yeah. some really clear and concrete examples of how um, parents can, can continue to be engaged with their child would be really excellent. Yeah. Um, so when we come back, maybe we can talk about that. And I'd also really love to talk about... Um, uh, storytelling in particular. So you and I talked before when we were preparing for the show about the role of storytelling. The Old Spice is an example of that storytelling, but I think the role of storytelling in some of this work, I think would be really exciting for us to get into as well. Sure. Yeah, so. absolutely. I, I'm, I'm excited to talk about it because I think the story is going to, that so many of these families get boiled down to the moment that caused the to cause the child to be removed where if we can bring in the whole family it, it, it does change the way we think about it so we'll be back in just a just a minute for those of you on facebook we'll be back in like two seconds and on the podcast we'll be back in a little bit hey listeners are you enjoying this show and do you want to hear more then please subscribe to our show on your favorite streaming platform like this show and tell others about us we are available on CastBox, Deezer, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, uh, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, and Apple Podcasts. So please connect with us there. You also can watch shows live being recorded on our Facebook site, The Awakening Educator. You can connect with us via Instagram or Twitter at The Awakening Educator. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, we've been busy recording a ton of terrific shows that will be rolling out over the rest of this year. So we would love to be able to have you be a regular member of our community. Thank you so much and have a great, great day. And welcome yeah. back. <laughs> uh, we are the Awakening Educator. I'm Susan Andrian. I'm Megan Sweet. And we are here um, having a conversation with Matt Anderson about the child welfare system and um, reimagining and rethinking what is what's really in the best interest of kids and what's really in the best interest of families and ultimately what's really in the best interest of our communities. Um, and so before we went on our break, we were going to start to have conversations about there were so many things Megan you said we were going to talk about so now I'm going back to the storytelling but I know there was something before that um I was just saying um and we can get to it maybe later just the idea of I was just appreciating the 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 simple ways that we can include um birth parents in a child's experience when they're in foster care 
And I would like to, at some point, hear more about the work that you're doing to try and avoid foster care in the first place, because I think that's the most ideal situation for all of us. Um, but I would love to get into storytelling um, because I'm biased towards it. Uh, if you guys love Bruce Perry, I love storytelling. So I'm going to I want to <laughs> jump in and and offer that. Um, you and I talked a little bit about the power of storytelling when we were just checking in before the show, Matt. But I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you see storytelling playing out in the work that you do and why you think it's important. Yeah. Um, there's so many, so many directions to go with that question. So uh, rein me in a little bit or you can guide in different ways. But I think that, so here's the, the first thing that comes to mind. That's I'm going to get a little wonky if that's okay. Um, I, I think about a lot of what we're, we're the work that I've been doing for, for years really is systems change related work, systems reform, you know, mm -hmm. changing the, the fundamental structures of how a child welfare system, education system, how it works. And so there's a model that I've come to really like that is this, it's the six conditions of systems change. And so it's just a, it's just an upside down pyramid model. And at the top, there's three, um, three components of systems change, three conditions. And it's the structural changes. It's policies, it's programs, practices, and it's the money. Where do we put money into our mm -hmm. system, right? So policy, practice, money. Those are three of the six conditions of systems change. So if you think about it, where do we usually go when we're trying to do reform of systems or changing systems? We usually go to, well, let's change the policy or what if there was more money or what if, you know, and so... That's good and that's necessary, but I think it misses uh, what's really underneath where our behaviors come from. What do we prioritize? Mm -hmm. What do we care about? What values are reflected in our policies and our dollars, our budgets, and whose values are reflected in those budgets? Mm -hmm. So you get underneath that and you say, okay, there are two other conditions of systems change, which is the power dynamics that lead to what changes we make in the, in the relationship or the proximity to the people that experience the results of our policies. Mm -hmm. And if we're not in relationship and in proximity to families that experience the child welfare system, and if we're not um, creating space for them to have some power and authority to decide what those policies are, then we're not going to create the best policies and practices. Mm -hmm. We're not going to allocate our dollars to all the right places because they're not going to be well-informed um, and contributed by people that really know what this feels like on the other end. So those are five conditions. At the, at the bottom of it is mindset. Mm. And it's the mindset that we have that dictates whether or not we're going to engage in relationship with community and create space to share power and then allow that to impact the system, the structures mm. of the systems. Mm. So if you get all the way down to mindset, like that means that systems don't, this is my opinion anyway, systems don't change, people change. Yeah. And when people change, they start to engage in different ways and they start to come up with different structural changes to their systems, to our systems. So how do people change? People change through stories. That's how we've born and raised from day one for millennia, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are educators. What, what's one of the best ways to reach somebody in education? is through a story that's well told that can draw a student in and get them interested and engaged and understanding in that way. Like stories are powerful tools to get at our mindset. So that like, that's one way that I kind of break it down of like, why is story so important? Story is important because it's how we operate as human beings. If we want to change somebody's mind, you can't really do that with a data point all that well. The data is really important, but you've got to embed that data in a story about why does it matter? Why do mm. I care? How do I even relate and connect to this? And story allows you to do that. Stories are sticky. Stories are compelling. Stories are influential. Stories get us to move. So, well, yeah. they're emotional, right? So it's like really yeah. connecting to that emotional com compassion, empathetic experiences that yeah. that transform how we think or feel about something. Um, and so yeah. I think you raised some really important points and 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 we aren't great at changing policy right i just i'm thinking about your interview with dr perry around this but also for pivots which which um by dr sean jen right who talks about the same this is coming we're all seeing this we're getting burnt out this work is so hard and we're feeling disillusioned by hitting the same walls 
And so this idea of like, okay, how are we, how do we change the way people think and feel about it so that the policies follow after in a way that doesn't kill us all on the way there, like so that we can find the joy and we can find the, 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 um, the compassion that allows us to feel like we have agency, like there's change, like there's hope. Right. Um, yeah. I, I do it. I do a talk on storytelling and what you're describing, Matt, I love the, the framework around the six um, parts of systems change and I'm a systems change lady too. So you, you got me um, hooked on two different fronts now. Um, and uh, the example I give is access to technology during the pandemic. And um so during the pandemic, uh, Ed Week put out uh, an article where they'd interviewed a bunch of different teachers talking about um, access to technology. And they gave information that is no surprise to anyone in education, um, which is that it, the, the more low income you are, the less access you have to high quality technology, Internet access, all the rest of that. Um, we've known about this actually for years. Right. We've known it's been a problem for a very long time. They put it out during the pandemic because, of course, it worsened during the pandemic because we were learning online and that was a problem. Nothing wrong with the article. It was just fine. Um, but it didn't actually do much. Right. Like right. it's a, to me, it's like it, it hits that head part, which is fine and important, but it doesn't actually catalyze action. So I counterbalanced it with um, an example that came out here in California. I'm sure you had yours in South Carolina, but there was a, a picture that went viral here in California. A mom took a picture of her daughters who were sitting on the ground outside of a Taco Bell um, doing their online learning because that was there was no access to the Internet. So she used it to show the, the challenges that we're having. And um, it motivated and moved people here in California. Um, not even a deep story, really. I mean, the story was a picture. Um, so I think stories mean more than just like a written yeah. narrative. But it, it gave a concrete example with humans attached to it that other humans could attach to it as well. Yeah. It led to policy changes here in California. Um, a ton of money went to um, address that right away. The article and the picture came out somewhat, not necessarily exactly the same time, but in the same well, COVID haze time. I don't know. Like COVID time is all different. Oh, right? but yeah, time's it running together. And happened COVID yesterday, and <laughs> happened years ago, and it's all messed up. But happened in the same last couple of years. Yeah. Um, the article didn't trigger a lot of action, but this picture. I mean, the girls got what they needed, but then also the school and the community made they made sure that every single child in that community had access to internet hotspots. Um, the legislature got in there and are changing policies all because of this one picture. Um, and so to me, I just feel like it's such a powerful example of what stories and storytelling can do in places where it can feel overwhelming because it does start to change our individual, like we can connect. As soon as we can connect, um, then we will be more activated. So anyway, I'm just well, really it, it may, the, the story that you tell in your podcasting out loud around um, the 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 baby in uh, foster care and the foster care parents who their experience and the and the birth parents and then ultimately what happened for this family, it was incredibly moving. And someone who who has been in you know who has worked with kids in foster care for my twenty plus career and has been on the mental health side of things that it allowed me to really s see what's possible, have a glimpse of what we should be doing. And, and it's super frustrating as a mental health provider to see that these systemic decisions that are being made, these policy decisions impact children and families in these deeply negative ways that we don't make decisions that are nece necessarily in the best interest of children. So if we, if we can tell these stories in a more meaningful way that also shift what people, how we show up for the child welfare system, for in, in, but in a way that is truly in the best welfare of children. Right. Yeah. And, and even, you know, I think one of the things I'm thinking about a lot and hopefully these stories that we're, we're putting out into the world will help with this. I think there's actually a need for us to reimagine whose best interest we're trying to serve. Yes. Are we trying to, to meet the best interest of the child? Or are we trying to meet the best interest of the, of the family? Yes. And I, and I, I think, you know, if it's about the That's best interest of the child or the best interest of the parent, 
Um, in either of those scenarios, and it, it's it's not about the best interest of the parent. We, we know that. It's about yeah. the best interest of the child. The safety of the child comes first. But I think the problem with that is that automatically, by, by nature of how the world works, now there's an, an us versus them. There's an adversarial. And mm-hmm. it's all caught up in the legal system. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, there's the there's the prosecution and the defense and like you just have everybody is pitted against each other about the best interest of the child and it separates the parent from the child because they're on the they're on the opposite sides of that um, conflict essentially and i think if we kind of reorient it around what's the best interest of this family Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden we're all coming together to say okay it's it's really about this this one thing it's about the family it's about what's what's in the best interest of the family and i think the, the, the episode that you're talking about with Brett and Jessica Crisp as foster parents, they had to go through their personal transformation to get to the place of, oh, right. if we care about um, London, the way that we demonstrate our care for London is how we support her mom. Right. So now it's in the best interest of the family and keeping this family together. And that story, it's so powerful because you get the personal journey that they go on from this thing that they say is their ultimate fear becoming one of the most beautiful things that's ever happened to them to have this experience with this 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 uh little girl and her mom and and reunification and then to kind of to to you know the power of story kind of one step further is that i had a a call with a, a therapist uh recently and she was saying oh i listened to the crisp episode and it's changed how I see my job as a therapist. And she works with kids who are in foster care. And it has totally shifted for her that, you know, the idea of like, well, my job is to be the therapist that helps keep this kid safe from their parents instead of, okay, what do I need to do to help them be in healthy relationship with their parents? Right. And that question about the healthy relationship, I think we don't ask that even the do- you know thinking about dosing and the way that the fa- fa- yeah. uh, the child welfare system both removes kids in such an abrupt way on both ends and so in the in in the Chris family um, when the ch- when London was removed to go back to their mom that was equally disruptive and harmful because yeah. it happens in this abrupt way and when we don't understand the the that we don't set the parents up for success right when you when you remove children so quickly and then you drop them back in without the effective support of the the things that got that family into that position in the first place right and so um i know some of the kids i've worked for the the visitations are not always structured in a way that are setting that family up for success either, right? So we have these long times where they don't see each other and then they come back together for these long sort of false, like artificially created spaces where it's like overly intense for both. And there isn't that dosing and spacing. And so um, if we do reimagine the lens that the places that kids and families interact, like how are we making this more of a, um, relational transitional experience that is contextual for, for the goodness of, of, of all folks involved. Yeah. I'm, what I'm hearing you both talking about too is this idea of redemption. And, you know, I want to be careful. There are times when we absolutely must remove children from homes. Absolutely. Um, because, you know, again, it's always the best interest of children. And sometimes reunification is the worst thing you could possibly do to a child. And, and so I know we're not talking about those people. Um, but I think this idea of redemption is really important. And in our society today, especially with social media and the council culture that is there, I feel like we are so fast to throw people away and to villainize people rather than to understand that we're all human. We all have failings. Some of us have huge and profound failings um, with our children and in our lives. And yet I, I have to believe that the path forward for us as human beings is redemption, yeah. is working towards um, everyone's redemption and their ability to, um, yeah, be, be learn and be new and, and come back. Um, okay. So I appreciate that. It, yeah. um, so I could say ahead. something about that, that, um, you know, the, the episode that we just put out yesterday um, with Sana, uh, that, that episode stood with me saying basically that, Megan, that's, you know, when, 
when, when we need to keep kids safe, we have a responsibility as a society to keep kids safe. And so we need a child protective system to be able to do that. And there are instances where it's very clear and, and cut, you know, that that's what we need to do. And that, that, that's Sana's experience as a kid. And so you get the, I won't get into it, but you get it at the beginning of the episode, you get what her, her childhood experience was. But what's so interesting about the rest of the story, because she has adopted and it's, you know, it's a, you know, it's a good experience and, and these sorts of things. But what you get in that story is kind of where I started at the beginning is that um, where, what about belonging? Mm -hmm. And what about where did I come from and who are my people and do I fit in? Do I belong anywhere? You know, when you, when you keep a kid safe from a, from a, a parent that is unsafe, um, there's still harm that's done to that child by being separated yeah. from their family. And I think these stories help us to really understand what that, what that harm actually looks like and what it feels like and what damage it can do. And then it should raise questions as curiosity issue, right? It should raise questions about, well, how do we keep a kid physically safe and emotionally and relationally safe at the same time right. and not allow the physical safety to trump the, the emotional and relational safety? Because I think, I think that's, that's Sana's experience, right? Her story is a story of a journey to find belonging and where she fits in and redemption, Right. These stories, you know, like I, I talk a lot about Father Greg Boyle, maybe somebody you all know with Homeboy Industries mm -hmm. in L.A. Yeah. His yep. new book, The Whole Language. Like, that's what this is. Right. Like Sana's mom, we still have to speak the whole language about her. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's unshakable goodness in all people. And how do we create enough um, compassion to see Sana's mom's unshakable goodness? And yeah. What comes from that? perspective yeah so needed uh i just i just feel like that's what we need in the world is that kind of an approach um and yeah i just think that's our path forward <laughs> what, oh yeah i teach uh, a graduate class on treating to my, uh treating children and adolescents at holy names university and uh, I hold assumptions. We read the assumptions at the beginning of every class. I have my students read them out loud. And the first one is that all parents are doing the best that they can with the resources and skills that they have available to them at the time. And, yes. and I truly 100% believe that sometimes <clears throat> parents don't have enough emotional internal resources or financial resources in order to do that. <clears throat> but if we come from that lens that they are doing the best that they can in that moment, and it's not enough to keep a child safe, then what do we need to do to support that parent to be yeah. able to show up in a way that still provides yeah. them the dignity and the relationship that the child is going to benefit from the most? Yeah. I think before we go on our next break and, and when we come back, what I'd love to do is talk about some of the ways that you're trying to um, forestall the length of time someone goes into foster care or goes into foster care at all. But I will just add my final plug about storytelling is not only does um, storytelling impact the way that we understand um, other people and bring us in and touch our hearts the way we've been talking about. Uh, but I'd be remiss not to point out that, at least for educators, although I'm sure it's for other people too, getting back to that changing ourselves, the bottom end of the systems change process, writing stories about our own experiences actually helps us shape and change the way we see and understand the world around us. So there's some research um, done by one of my professors, Diane Cattell, who, whenever I talk, the dogs start in. So if you're hearing dogs, I apologize. Um but that showed that if educators write about an experience, say I wrote about the cell phone taking away incident with this kid, um, the act of me writing about it, even if I fictionalize parts of it, um, I will gain new and more profound insights about my leadership and myself that will help me be better next time. So this idea of understanding our own stories is just as important if not more so than understanding the stories of others. Because if we don't understand ourselves, then we are going to have a really hard time connecting with the stories of other people. So I just wanted to bring that forward. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, na narrative therapy, right? Yep. Yep. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's research on journaling and the benefits of that, all the things. Um, right. Anyway, on that like <laughs> note, uh, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I'd love to hear about some of the work you do around um, helping the people to stay out of the system if possible. Are you ready to change the way we do school? Yeah, me too. 
This is Megan Sweet from The Awakening Educator, and I've designed programming that empowers educators to reimagine how they approach their work. The pandemic has laid bare what most of us already knew. Our schools are under-resourced. Our system is set up to fail our most vulnerable students. Our educators are burned out and overwhelmed, and we all deserve better. With almost 30 years in education and 15 dedicated to leading school reform, I have been there and I get it. I've sat in the same seats that many of you have. I've been a classroom teacher and a school administrator. I've led district, county, and statewide reforms. I've coached dozens of teachers, principals, and executive leaders, and I've partnered with students, parents, and community activists. I have the scars from a lifetime of scrapping out an education, but also the lived experience that change is possible. After facing the prospect of quitting education myself, I began a journey to understand how I could stay in the profession I love, but do it in a way that was sustainable. Here's what I now know. It begins with self-care. Prioritizing ourselves can feel counterintuitive for educators, but when we give, give, give without attending to our own needs, eventually we run out of resources and burnout ensues. But when we stop fighting the system and instead look inward for the answers we seek, We live more empowered lives and are better able to create the educational settings where our students will thrive. Here's what I also know. We already have the answers inside of us. We just sometimes need help getting them out. And that's where I come in. I love supporting educators to find their inner voice and match all those school smarts with their innate instincts about what works best for students. My superpowers are listening well, synthesizing ideas, and breaking complex processes into understandable and accessible parts. How will we do it? It all starts with doing what I call self-work, dedicating time and attention to building a relationship with ourselves. We do this in a course I call the Beliefs Lab. By the end of this course, you'll understand why self-care is essential for being an effective educator, and you'll have strategies you can use right now. You will also get a handle on some of those beliefs that are helping you and those that are getting in the way. The next step is doing the schoolwork, leading classroom and school change. In the course I call The Cycle, you will learn a process for realizing goals for yourself and for your educational context simultaneously. You will also have deeper insights and strategies for putting your plans into action. Want more support as you engage in the self-work and schoolwork? I've got you covered. My personalized coaching and consulting services are designed to meet you in your school right where you are and support you to clarify your vision for the future. Want to know even more about what I do? My book is a great place to start. An Educator's Guide for Using Your Three Eyes details the self-work and schoolwork that I described above and talks about concrete ways that you can start to feel better right now. If you want to learn more about how to work with me and the courses I just described, please come to my website www.your3eyes.com. That's Y-O-U-R, the number three, E-Y-E-S.com. I can't wait to support you to realize a better future for yourself and for your school community. Uh, Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, We're having a really um, powerful conversation today with Matt Anderson, who um, works with families in the child welfare system. And we've been talking about the power of storytelling and understanding um, the stories of the families that are um, caught up in this system and how that can impact the way that we interact with them. Um, what I was teasing before the break was that hopefully we could hear a little bit about the work you do, Matt, to try and keep people out of the system, if, if at all possible, or to limit their duration in the system. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what that looks like. Yeah, definitely. Um, so maybe so through Children's Home Society of North Carolina, the, there's there's a there's two um, two primary primary like priorities that that we work on um, as an organization. So one is you know really trying to improve outcomes for kids and families in that are in the child welfare system. So I won't go into that in detail, but we're doing a lot of different things programmatically and through. Um, you know, kind of legislative advocacy work around just, you know, are there, are there better ways to use foster care as a pathway to permanency, as a way to help kids exit foster care, reunification, guardianship, adoption, you know, and then other evidence-based practice models that we can bring into the child welfare system to make sure older youth in foster care are exiting because they're at high risk of aging out. 
or in-home family preservation services when imminent risk of removal, how do we get into the home and support the family and prevent? So those are all things we're doing kind of right within the four walls of the child welfare system to make sure we're doing everything we can to help kids leave the system because we know we don't want kids growing up in, in a system. Um, so there's that kind of set of work, but I think the way I, I tend to look at it is that we've been doing that work for so long as an organization, you know, eventually you start to, you know, awaken, I suppose, if I can use that pun, if that's a pun, um, <laughs> you know, you start to awaken to, well, why are kids coming into foster care in the first place? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the second priority area for us, which is, which is much, much more new for us as an organization is to say, well, how do we keep families safely together? Whenever possible, how do we keep families together? So there might be some programmatic ways to do that, but really we're thinking about that from more of an, an influence and innovation point of view. Hmm. And that's where the Institute for Family has kind of grown out of. So this six conditions of systems change, you know, we're taking that theory of change or that, that theory of systems change and other things, other theories to think about how do we answer that question of what's driving child welfare entries at the local community level through listening to the experiences of family members in that community, of families in that community? And so that's just one thing that we're, we're working on right now or right at the beginning of it. But we're working with Randolph County, North Carolina, and we're about five or so months into a project that would be a multi-year project that will start with a learning phase, you know, qualitative, quantitative, you know, data collection of like, what are the underlying root cause conditions, which is the kind of the big thing here, right? Like, it's not how do we prevent child maltreatment through parenting and other programs and interventions, mm -hmm. but what are the root cause conditions at play that would lead to family stress and overburden that then might show up like child maltreatment or neglect? Right. So we're trying to understand what are those root cause conditions in that community, learning about that through um, engaging with the community and family members. And then let's start to do kind of a convening co-designing phase of work where we're making sense of all of that learning and coming to some um, hypothesis about, well, this is the problem. Here are some solution ideas. And then can we get into like a testing phase? Um, implementing and testing some of the ideas and solutions that are emerging from this community to say, well, if we address these issues, then maybe we can improve family well-being and keep more kids out of foster care. So if that all made sense, that's how we're approaching it right now. And, and uh, we're doing some work with uh, folks in Washington state as well that are kind of going down this pathway. And so we're trying to organize some, you know, national kind of uh, learning collaborative work around that so we can hopefully as we learn, share that learning with others. It's kind of why we, in some ways, create the Institute for Family as this communications platform. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to just yeah. be storytelling through podcasts and short films, but can we tell the story of systems change over uh -huh. time? As we kind of learn and grow and, and see some successes, hopefully, of the work. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's kind of how we're, we're approaching it, but happy to, to dive in anywhere there because I know that's, that was a lot of well, that's right up your alley, Megan. All this, I mean, there were two things. A lot of what you said is is that it's, it's connected to me too. But tell Megan, exactly how I approach the truth. Megan, yeah, really, well, it made me think of the Heath brothers and Made to Stick. Um, I imagine you know that book. Um, but essentially, they tell a bunch of different stories about how, or and I think I'm, I'm now I'm going to attribute it to the Heath brothers, and I could be wrong, but I think I'm right. Um, I read a lot of systems change books, and yeah. so forgive me if I if I'm giving the credit to the Heath brothers in, inappropriately. But well, they're right here in North Carolina, so that's good. Oh, there you go. Then a local yeah. favorite. I'm sure there are right. celebrities for you guys there. But he, they told a story of of malnutrition. I think it's in one of their books of malnutrition in um, in an Asian country, um, and they were trying to figure out how to like stop the malnutrition um because mostly what the families had access to was rice and so they're trying to solve this problem of malnutrition and they did exactly what you described or the success story that they didn't do it they, the success story they describe is yeah. is of um or whomever i'm referencing describes is them actually looking at like becoming curious at first they came in with like a top-down solution we're going to push in right, right. or the experts right. very white supremacy uh, we're going to come in and tell you um, what to do. 
Um, and it didn't work, right? So they were, tr they were trying with like information and trying to give like kind of tell the moms the information what they needed to do and just wasn't actually moving the needle. So somebody on that team started just to ask some questions and look at the data and see, well, which kids were doing better and which ones weren't, which ones were gaining weight more, which ones were having less challenge, you know, the, the challenges that go along with, with malnutrition. And what they found was essentially by becoming curious and <laughs> assuming that the people there know something um, and we don't need to come right. in and tell them what to do. And what they found was that some families the ones that were successful were using their environment to augment the rice and the food that they were being given um, that they had access to. So maybe they had, they picked wild greens and they, they chopped that up and put that in the rice, or maybe it was like tiny, like krill sized, you know, sea life that they were able to have access to in their environment that they were able to put in the rice. And that this is what made the difference. And then they, once they realized that, then they trained them parents to teach each other um, how, what they were doing. And it's such a simple, you know, and, and they tested that out. So, um, so what you're, when you're telling me that story, just maybe reminded me like so much of the wisdom that we need to change our systems are actually already within us right. and within the people that we're trying to support. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to learn to stop and listen to them and, 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 and understand that mm -hmm. and be willing to change. The other part of what I was hearing you doing, talking about was kind of a design thinking kind of approach, which is, yeah. you know, trying something out, see if it works. Yeah. Um, if not, uh, cool. Try something else, um, which is also works really well. So, yeah, 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 def definitely. And, uh, you know, I think it, it, it starts too with just a, a, a value base of I don't know, exact right way to say this, but sort of like, you know, just unlocking potential, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we're, we don't, we don't, we're not coming into this community saying here are the solutions and here's what we're going to bring. And, I think what we're, yeah, it's more kind of curiosity and, and, you know, question asking of like, well, what's already here, you know, what's, where, where, what's the potential that's already here or, you know, people know how to solve problems. They know, you know, but oftentimes there's not the conditions that are there that are needed to solve those problems. So where's the, is the resource allocation in the right place or, you know, um, anyway, I think there's, there's all kinds of, things that you can get into but it is that you know that another another uh person i reference a lot is uh brian stevenson is that mm. that simple idea of proximity you know the, mm. the closer you get to the people experiencing the issues is the closer you get to the solutions mm. and we, we stay pretty far away we, we, stay are, far away. we are actually coming up on the end of this we are coming up at the end of our show um, oh, I don't want to end. I know, but we want to make sure we give folks an opportunity uh, to hear where they can uh, learn more, you know, hear more about you and see what you're doing. I know I'm going to, the podcast, to yeah. put that out. Um, where else can folks hear from you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so instituteforfamily.org is, is the website and uh, seen out loud is the podcasts. So you can certainly go to our website and find out all kinds of things of, of what we're up to. Seen Out Loud is on all podcast platforms. And um, so you can certainly uh, find that there. And then, you know, I, you know, personally for me, um, you know, I, I'm everywhere but but Twitter, basically. Um, so <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn is probably where I spend my most time on social media. Um, but my name is Matt Anderson. So finding me on social media is probably a challenge. It's the most <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Good, good luck with that but uh <laughs> that's funny Matt. yeah well we'll definitely um this is I'm, I'm excited to listen to your podcast this has been such a pleasure to talk with you um yeah. i'm really grateful yeah. to know of the work that you're doing in the world and that you're the one doing it um and just want to thank you on behalf of the families that you're serving um it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show yeah. class yeah. is yeah, dismissed great. Yeah, thank you wasn't that yeah. fun Susan and Megan are always happy to greet you on the next episode of The Awakening Educator. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Education is the foundation for a brighter future. Open your eyes to The Awakening Educator.